Let us worship the Lord together as we exalt his name and magnify him as the Lord of lords and the King of kings. Would you join with me in turning to Psalm 99? Psalm 99, we'll be singing verses 1 through 5 to tune number 41. The eternal Lord doth reign as king. Let all the people quake. He sits between the cherubim. Let the earth be moved and shake. The Lord in Zion, great and high, above all people is. Thy great and dreadful name, for it is holy. Let them bless. The king's strength also loves The king's strength also judgment loves. Thou settlest in equity, just judgment thou dost execute in Jacob righteously. The Lord our God exalt on high and reverently do ye before his footstool worship him. The Holy One is he. Let us magnify the name of our Lord. Shall we enter the Lord's presence in prayer? Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, heaven and earth are filled with thy glory. Lord, who alone is to be magnified but thee? Lord, if your people should boast, indeed, let us boast in our Lord, that we, Lord, might exalt you, that we might lift you up, that uh, we might gaze upon you in your glory, that we might, Lord, receive in your presence uh, the healing of our souls, uh, the feeding uh, of our hearts and minds with the spiritual blessings that come from on high. 
For you, Lord, alone have made us to receive a blessing. You, Lord, declared before the foundation of the world that we should be redeemed in Christ Jesus, our Lord. You and your sovereign plan have executed a, a wondrous salvation that uh, was gloriously displayed on Calvary's cross, where our Savior, the pure and holy Lamb, that taketh away the sin of the world, uh, was uh, executed for, for our sin, that we might be in him the righteousness of God. We do rejoice in uh, the wondrous uh, plan of salvation, Lord, that was carried forth in your design and delight to make atonement for your people, that you would be a just God and yet the justifier of many. Lord, we do rejoice uh, that you have sent forth your Holy Spirit into this world, Lord, that we might know the wonder of your presence with us that we, Lord, might be drawn uh, to you by that everlasting love that draws us, that we, Lord, might know the wonder and power of uh, you, your redeeming grace, oh Lord, to impart to us faith in Christ, uh, that we might know the, the power of the Holy Spirit to bring conviction of sin, uh, to bring, Lord, uh, that faith by which we cast our burdens upon you and experience the wonders of your grace, uh, Lord, that we might know forgiveness of sin, that we might sense within uh, hearts cleansed and purified by the blood sprinkled upon us, Lord, in, in that, that cleansing that the Holy Spirit brings and the application of your atoning death to our hearts and, and lives. We, we thank you, O Lord, for your redeeming grace that is demonstrated in, in our resurrected Lord Jesus who reigns at the right hand of, of you, O Father. Uh, Lord, as we see him as the one who is our great high priest, who, who ever liveth to make atonement, uh, intercession for us, Lord, by the the appeal of, of his blood at, at the throne of grace, at the mercy seat. Lord, we thank you for our Lord and Savior who, who daily uh, intercedes on our behalf in, in, in a fashion that we don't always understand, but as you, Lord, seek to carry forth the, the wonder of your salvation on our behalf. And so, Lord, we're gathered before you this day, and our hearts rejoice. Uh, Lord, we delight in you because you are the living God who has made uh, uh, such blessing for us uh, in, in the eternal promises of your kingdom, Lord. Our hope for, for comfort in this life and, and our hope for everlasting joy as we partake of the, of the pleasures that are at your right hand forevermore. Lord, we would come into your presence this day and ask humbly that you would, would minister your grace afresh to us. Lord, we confess before you our, our, our continued struggle with sin. We confess before you, Lord, how we have fallen uh, in, in time and time again in this past week, Lord, in, in thought, in word, and in deed. Lord, we have done those things which you have forbidden, and we have left undone that, those things which you have required. Lord, our, our sin is, uh, is ever before us. Uh, not only do we remember past sin, but, Lord, we are mindful of our, our, of our present affliction. And we come, O oh Lord, confessing our sin before you, asking, Lord, that you would uh, indeed uh, fulfill that glorious promise that you would forgive our sin and that you would cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so, Lord, we ask that your renewing grace be upon us this day, that our hearts would be encouraged, Lord, that we would, would look afresh into the face of the Lord Jesus Christ and behold him in all his glory and that we might find comfort and strength, uh, Lord, to live before you with love uh, Lord, with adoration and with, uh, Lord, an enduring obedience as those who are surrendered 
to you in the covenant of grace. Lord, we do ask that you would be with those who are afflicted in body. Lord, we ask that you would minister and, and refresh and restore. We ask for those, Lord, who, who struggle daily with uh, their besetting sins. We pray, Lord, that your grace might be mighty upon them. Lord, you've taught us that in Christ uh, sin no longer has dominion over us. And we pray, O oh Lord, that your promise that... Uh, you and your faithfulness, Lord, would not allow us to be tempted beyond what we are able, but with, with the temptation, provide a way of escape that we might uh, be able to bear up under it, Lord. We pray that you would give us victory over sin. You would give us, Lord, an abiding faith that would allow us to see the deceptions of the evil one, Lord, and that we might... Uh, receive grace, Lord, to turn away from sin, to despise, Lord, uh, the allurements of this world, that we might, Lord, walk in faithfulness before you. Lord, we do pray for our covenant children. Lord, we, we, we long, Lord, to hear them name the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, to enter into personal covenant with him. And we pray, Lord, that you would fulfill your covenant as the God who keeps covenant to a thousand generations, Lord, that you would indeed uh, bring about the, the merciful work of your Holy Spirit within the hearts and minds of the children of this congregation to draw them to the Savior, to cause them to embrace him as their living Lord, Lord, uh, that they might uh, know his saving grace as their personal experience. Lord, we do ask that you would be with those who are, who are under discipline, Lord, for a disobedience, Lord. We, we pray, Lord, that your convicting spirit would come, uh, Lord, to humble their hearts, uh, to break the shackles of sin and, and the deceptions of the evil one that they might like as the prodigal son of old, uh, be able to come uh, to realize that there, there is a much more blessing to be found. Lord, in their heavenly Father's house, in the outpouring of your grace and provision to those who humbly serve you as your children. Lord, we do ask that you would be with us now in this assembly hour. Lord, bless and encourage each of our hearts. Cause us to, to go away from this place with a, with a sense uh, that the saints so long ago had, that surely the Lord was in this place. Lord, that we might know the wonder of your love, the tenderness of the comfort of your spirit, that our hearts might exalt before you. Lord, we would not conclude our prayer without praying for Pastor McCurley. We thank you, Lord, for that ministry that has been offered on thy behalf in, in India this past week and for the, the ministry that lies ahead in Sri Lanka in the coming week. We ask, O oh Lord, that your, your hand would be upon that ministry to bless. Lord, that it might be multiplied uh, many, many times, Lord, that uh, the souls of many might be strengthened and encouraged, that pastors might be greater equipped for the work uh, of ministry that you have for them, that, uh, that uh, this all might be accounted, Lord, as, as that which you would be pleased to bless, Lord, for the expansion and the strengthening of your kingdom. We ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Let us continue our praise of, of the Lord as we turn to Psalm 77. Psalm 77, we'll be singing verses 14 through 20. 14 through the end of the psalm to the praise of our God, using two number 25. Thou art the God that wonders doth by thy right hand most strong, thy mighty power thou hast declared the nations among. To thine own people with thine arm thou didst redemption bring to Jacob's sons and to the tribes of Joseph that do spring. Uh, let us uh, exalt the Lord as the great shepherd of, our sh of, it, of the sheep as we, we give praise to him. La, la, la.
are blessed to have a baptism to be uh, conducted this morning. Baptism of uh, covenant children is a very precious thing. I know you know this well in a congregation comprised of so many children. It's a, a real joy and delight to put our trust in, in the promise of the Lord as we see it uh, expressed in Genesis chapter 17 and verse 7 where the Lord declares, And I will establish my covenant between me and thee and thy seed after thee in their generations for an everlasting covenant to be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee. Skipping to verse 10, he says, This is the covenant which ye shall keep between me and you and thy seed after thee, every man-child among you shall be circumcised. And ye shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a token of the covenant twixt me and you. And he that is eight days old shall be circumcised among you, every man-child in your generations. He that is born in the house, or bought with money of any stranger which is not of thy seed. In verse 14, And the uncircumcised man-child whose flesh of his foreskin is not circumcised, that soul shall be cut off from his people. He hath broken my covenant. This was the covenant that the Lord made with Abraham he establishes for us the nature of the covenant that he makes with his covenant people. He indicates that it's an everlasting covenant. He indicates that it's a covenant not only with those who enter into a covenant with him by a profession of faith, but it is a covenant that he establishes with their children after them. Indeed, he specifies under his covenant that he made with Abraham that a child of eight days of age was to receive the token of that covenant between God and the believing soul. We see in a commentary on this passage in Genesis in Romans chapter 4 the Holy Spirit directing the Apostle Paul to indicate that uh, at verse 11, that Abraham received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of faith which he had, yet being uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all them that believe, though they be not circumcised, that righteousness might be imputed to them also. And we understand under the new covenant, there's no longer the application of uh, the sign of circumcision, uh, for that was also used as a sign of covenant with Moses and the people of Israel, but rather what we have as a sign of the new covenant in Christ's blood is the sprinkling of water, a symbol of cleansing. And we see with baptism that there is the same symbolism that was actually designated in the covenant of grace that God established with Abraham. For the Apostle Paul makes very clear that that seal that was placed, that sign that was placed upon Abraham and his male descendants was a sign of of righteousness by faith, which is precisely what we have in the covenant that the Lord has made with us as those who stand under the new covenant in Christ's blood. Uh, we see this in, in the, the apostles' sermon at, at Pentecost as, as he calls on them to believe and, and to repent and and that the promise of the Holy Spirit is to them and to their children as well. We see this in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 when believers are told that even one believing parent 
has children that are designated as holy, set apart unto God in a special relationship as covenant children. But perhaps one of the most encouraging uh, passages of Scripture that encourage us uh, to bring our children into covenant uh, with the Lord is the example of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. You remember, he said as the, the parents were bringing their children to the, to the Lord for a blessing, and, and the disciples were holding them back and, and telling the people, essentially, don't bother the, the Savior with, with these little children. And he said, suffer the little children to come unto me, for as such is the kingdom of heaven. And the Lord Jesus made this point so strongly in the sense that when later he's before this woman who's a Syrophoenician woman and, and she's pleading with the Savior that he would heal her demon-possessed daughter. And the Lord Jesus says of this woman that the, the promises are to the sons of Israel. And he excludes her. And we're, we're taken back with the way he, he seems to be pushing this woman away with a desperate need. And then she says, well, even the puppies are able to eat under the table the crumbs that the children drop. And Jesus commends her for her faith. And he heals her daughter, her unbelieving, her demon-possessed daughter in that very moment. We see then the Lord bringing his covenant to bear in the lives of his children. And so it's with rejoicing that we call forth uh, the Reader family to, to present uh, their dear little Nathan Irvin Reader for baptism. Would Chris and Kara, would you come forward with Nathaniel? Would you join me in prayer? Our Heavenly Father, we come into your presence now in obedience to your word that we, Lord, would keep covenant with you and that we would acknowledge before you the covenant that you have made with us that lays claim not on, a, on our own souls as uh, those who trust in Christ, but lays claim on our children as well. And Lord, we ask now that you would bless uh, us as we apply the sign that you have given us, the sign given to those who have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. We ask, Lord, that you would bless what we do, that it might be multiplied uh, as you apply by your Spirit uh, the com covenant commitment of these parents uh, in the, their training of their dear little son, Lord, that he might be nurtured and brought up in the fear of the Lord and that the Holy Spirit would mightily apply the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ upon his life. Lord, bless now this act that we take in faith in your promise of an eternal covenant. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. specifically come to ask your blessing on Nathaniel now. We ask, O oh Lord, that you would watch over and keep him, cause him to grow strong, that he might grow in favor with God and man, that he might reach maturity. Lord, that you'd be pleased to give him a long life, uh, you would give him a life under your blessing, 
that he, as your covenant child, might be sustained by your grace. Lord, that he might uh, receive by your grace the instruction of his father and mother, that he might receive the encouragement from the congregation of the people who he worships with uh, week by week. And we pray, Lord, that you would bring him soon in, in an early time in his life to that time when he would make a commitment of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and testify in faith that Jesus is indeed Lord of his life. Lord, we know that's impossible apart from your grace and the outpouring of your spirit into Nathaniel's life. And we ask then, Lord, that you would give much grace to his parents as they nurture. And Lord, the mighty working of your Holy Spirit for the redeeming of his soul. We ask this in Jesus' name. Let us turn to our Old Testament lesson as we find it in Psalm 119 at verse 105. We'll be reading through to verse 112. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. I have sworn and I will perform it, that I will keep thy righteous judgments. I am afflicted very much. Quicken me, O Lord, according to thy word. Accept, I beseech thee, the free will offerings of my mouth, O Lord, and teach me thy judgments. My soul is continually in my hand. Yet I do not forget thy law. The wicked have laid a snare for me, yet I erred not from thy precepts. Thy testimonies I have taken as a heritage forever, for they are the rejoicing of my heart. I have inclined my heart to perform thy statutes always, even to the end. Thus far, the reading of God's word. To him be glory. Amen. Let us continue the praise of our Lord as we turn to Psalm 78. Psalm 78 will be singing verses 1 through 4. This is a blessed psalm. It's a, it's a wonderful psalm that we be singing uh, on the occasion of Nathaniel's baptism because it's a, it's a psalm that speaks of, uh, of the glories and the mysteries of God's covenant with us. Attend my people to my law, thereto give thou an ear. The words that from my mouth proceed attentively do hear. My mouth shall speak a parable and sayings dark of old the same which we have heard and known, and us our fathers told. We see there the, the testimony that's come from generation to generation as, as our fathers are, are fulfilling the responsibility that God has given to train up your children in the fear and the admonition of the Lord. We also will them not conceal from their post posterity them to the generation to come, declare will we the praises of the Lord our God and his almighty strength, the wondrous works that he hath done, we will show forth at length that a generation yet to be mourned might yet come to know the Lord who is the King of glory. Let us worship him.
our New Testament lesson, would you join me in turning to Hebrews chapter 12? We worship a covenant God who expresses the glories of his covenant in the most beautiful way, particularly in this epistle to the Hebrews, contrasting the old covenant with the new covenant in Christ Jesus our Lord. Let us then take heed to the word of God as we find it in Hebrews chapter 12. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Ye have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with the, you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? But if ye be without chaste, chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then ye are bastards and not sons. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. Now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous, Nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Wherefore, lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees, and make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it rather be healed." Follow peace with all, and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Looking diligently, lest any fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. For you know how that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. For ye are not come unto the mount that might be touched, that burned with fire, nor unto blackness and darkness and tempe tempest, and the sound of a trumpet and the voice of words which voice they heard in they, which voice they that heard entreated that the, the word should not be spoken to them any more for they could not endure that which was commanded and if so much as a beast touched the mountain it shall be stoned or thrust through with a dart 
And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I exceedingly fear and quake. But ye are come unto the Mount Zion, unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. See that ye refuse not him that speaketh. For if they escape not who refused him that spake on earth, much more shall not we escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven, whose voice then shook the earth, but now he hath promised, saying, Yet once more I shake not the earth only, but also heaven. And this word, yet once more, signifieth the removing of the things that are shaken as of, that are made, of, as of things that are made, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain wherefore we receive we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved let us have grace whereby we may serve god acceptably with reverence and godly fear for our god is a consuming fire thus far the reading of god's word may he be glorified We turn our reflections to Psalm 119, verses 105 through 112. We see a beautiful reflection of, of divine grace in the psalmist's life. We, we see him devoted to his Lord in, in an impassioned way in which he, he casts himself upon the Lord as the covenant God. We see here... Uh, such devotion that oftentimes we fail to see under people who are under the new covenant in Christ's blood. And as we've read in, in, in Hebrews chapter 12, and as we see throughout uh, the letter to the Hebrews, we see the, the contrast between old covenant and new covenant. Uh, bec but what old covenant required in terms of its awesome fear and, and the wonders of God's grace under the Lord Jesus Christ. The new covenant so far surpassing the old. And so we might ask ourselves, why is it that we read such, such words of devotion and passages like the one before us in Psalm 119? Why don't we see that kind of devotion consistently in the lives of new covenant believers? And I would suggest that perhaps there's a need for new covenant believers to understand that the covenant of grace also requires a covenanting on the part of the believer. Oftentimes we see the new covenant of grace in Christ Jesus as being, yes, initiated by God. But it's so seen as initiated from God that there's not a sense of, of the response that is to be given by those who are by faith in covenant with God through Jesus Christ. And so I draw your attention to, to verse 106, where the psalmist says, I have sworn and I will perform it, that I will keep thy righteous judgments. There's a, a sense in which the old covenant believer swore to God an allegiance, a loyalty, a belonging under the covenant. And I would ask you, do we not see the same thing 
under the new covenant. A binding of our hearts to God. Does not the new covenant require an oath of loyalty to God? And then we'll be asking, what are the implications of of confessing faith in Jesus? And then thirdly, we'll be asking, does our text, what does our text teach us regarding our proper obligations to our Lord? We'll be looking at, at that briefly. Well, does the new covenant require an oath of loyalty to the Lord? Is it not appropriate that we understand that we've sworn allegiance to the Lord? The idea of covenant is very clearly in the scriptures. Uh, we, we refer to our Old Testament and our New Testament that are included in the scriptures as, uh, as reflecting the, the covenant that was made at Mount Sinai and, and the covenant that is made as the Lord Jesus offers himself on Calvary's hill. And that covenant structure the idea of covenant has implied it that you have an initiator of the covenant and you have one who enters into that covenant with the one who has initiated it. In ancient times, a, a king would come and, and, and conquer an area and there would be kings who had been defeated who would be allowed to continue to rule in their, their country as long as they pledged allegiance to the dominant king who had conquered the land. As long as there was a, a pledge of, uh, of bringing taxation to, to support the work of the kingdom and to bring those who would serve in military service in order to support the sovereign who was over all. Uh, and as we enter into covenant with God who's initiated, who's conquered our hearts and, and initiated a relationship with us, there, there is a response that is called forth from us, and, and it's a, a, a taking of an oath that we will serve him faithfully. Now, when we ask the question, does the new covenant require an oath of loyalty, we might ask ourselves, well, didn't Jesus say in the Sermon of the Mount in Matthew 5, 33 through 37, that, that we were not to swear, that we were not to take oaths? We hear Jesus saying, again, you have heard that it hath been said by them of old time, you shall not forswear thyself, but shall perform unto the Lord thine oaths. But I say unto you, swear not at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, neither by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king, neither shalt thou swear by thy head, because thou canst not make one hair white or black. But let your communication be yea, yea, nay, nay, for whatsoever is more than these cometh to evil, of evil. We should realize when we hear these words of the Lord Jesus as we hear the rest of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is, is dealing with abuses that have taken place. And he's sitting a correction, and, and while Jesus is, is saying to them, swear not at all, let your yes be yes and your no be no, what he's really dealing with is they're swearing falsely. Because they, they would have a, a gradations of, of promises they'd make. Oh, if I swear by heaven, I really have to keep my word. But if I swear by earth, you know, that's not as serious a promise. And, and if I swear by... And so, you see, it was really, they had gradations of honesty. And the Lord Jesus is saying, no, no. Let your yes be yes, and your no be no. What we see is that God has not done away with all taking of oaths and vows. You experience this in your own life. When you get married, no one says, well, you shouldn't take a vow. No, you take a vow. You pledge yourself, not only in a covenant to your spouse, but in a covenant with God. 
And we see in the scriptures that this covenant is something that God has established with us. In Hebrews chapter 6 at verse 17, God speaks of his covenant he's made. The fact that he has taken an oath. It's strange that a God who never sins, cannot lie, would set him forth his promise in, in the form of an oath. But he says, wherein God willing to more abundantly show unto the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel confirmed it by an oath. And isn't that why we take oaths? Isn't that why we swear? We're, we're trying to affirm the fact that what was been said will be performed. And so God himself confirmed his promise with an oath that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope that is set before us, a hope that is in Christ Jesus. What's he doing? He's trying to give us the uttermost encouragement that when God has promised his grace to us in Christ, we can rest absolutely assured that what he's promised he will perform. The oath that God has made in his word again and again to assure his people is, is referred to even in the birth account of the Lord Jesus Christ in Luke chapter 1. At verse 70, as the Lord speaks of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, he says, As he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets, which have been since the world began, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to perform the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath which he swore to our father Abraham. Then listen now to the oath the the summary of that oath that was made to Abraham, that he would grant unto us that we being delivered out of the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. This is God's oath to his people. A covenant that he makes... A, uh, and he calls forth then a reciprocal oath. Whenever we, we hear the people of God declaring that, that, uh, that God is Lord of them, we, we speak of him being our God and we being his people. It's, it's, it's a, a covenant between two parties. You don't have a covenant if you don't have two parties. It's, it's the coming together of two parties in an agreement that binds each other to one another. And God has established then a covenant with us through Jesus Christ. You know this when you come to the Lord's table, do you not? When you take up the cup, it's the cup of the new covenant in Christ's blood. It's a covenant relationship. When we come to the table, yes, we focus on Christ's death for us on the cross. But there's a certain sense when we come to the table, as often as we do this, we are renewing covenant with God. We're calling to mind what he has promised to us and rejoicing in his promise. But we're also renewing our commitment to walk with him by faith. And the gospel call calls us to enter into an oath that we will follow him. Much like what we've read in, in Psalm 119, verse 106. I have sworn and I will perform it that I will keep thy righteous judgments. I often speak of Isaiah as being the one who proclaims the gospel in the, New Te in the Old Testament. We see so many passages in, in, in Isaiah that speak of, of, of the coming of the Messiah, the glory and the wonder uh, of what God will do to redeem a people unto himself. In Isaiah chapter 45, at verse 22, the Lord calls forth to his people and he says, Look unto me and be saved. For I am God and there is none other. I have sworn by myself. 
The word has gone out of my mouth in righteousness and shall not return. That unto me every knee shall bow, every tongue shall swear. That's the vow that God has promised. Everyone shall swear, shall take an oath. Those who wish to be saved enter into covenant with the Lord. Take an oath of allegiance to him. And I would suggest to you that when we confess Jesus Christ is Lord. And more specifically, when we confess Jesus is my Lord. That this is an oath of fealty to the Lord Jesus Christ. That indeed he reigns over you. I'd like to demonstrate uh, by drawing your attention to places in the New Testament where Isaiah 45, 23 are referenced. I first draw your attention to Romans chapter 14 and verse 11. There the Apostle Paul indicates that he's quoting Scripture but when he says, For it is written... As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. Did you catch the difference there, though? In Isaiah 45, 23, that every knee shall bow and every tongue shall swear. Paul, quoting that scripture, says, every knee shall bow to me. And every tongue shall confess to God. Is Paul misquoting? No. He's actually quoting from the Greek translation of the Old Testament. The Septuagint. It's word for word. He's not modifying the statement, but he's simply emphasizing what is indeed the intent of swearing. It's a swearing of, of loyalty, of allegiance. And that's what takes place when you confess not simply Jesus, but Jesus as Lord. He's the master of your life. What did Jesus say? Why do you call me Lord or Master and you won't do what I say? There's a pledge of allegiance to the Lord. And again, in Philippians chapter 2, verse 9 and following, Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven and things in earth and things under earth, the earth. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You see, the way I understand it, the Lord is saying that when you confess Jesus as Lord, you are swearing that he is Lord of your life. He's master of you. That you will say with the psalmist, then I have sworn and I will perform it. That I will keep thy righteous judgments. I will obey. This is so desperately needed in our understanding today. For we see in the evangelical church in these days. And, and a lot of times we look into our own lives and we see the problem as well. People claiming that Jesus is Lord. But there is no sense of, of loyalty and obedience. And following the counsel of our God. Young people, perhaps you've, you've noticed that, that things are different today, but you've probably read enough stories to know that in the early times of our nation, if, if somebody went out to war and, and then they turned back, what happened? If they abandoned their position as a soldier and, and they turned back, what would happen? When they were caught, they were stood up and they were shot, weren't they? They had been a traitor to the cause. 
In cowardice, they turn back from following the way. And, and the Lord is speaking to us here of, of a call that he makes upon our lives. When, when he pours out his blessing, his covenant blessing on us, there is a response that is to be made to the Lord. Jesus is Lord. Indeed, he is Lord. We see another example of this, uh, simply to, to reinforce in your mind the fact that when you confess faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, when someone professes Jesus to be their Lord, that indeed it is a covenanting with God. I draw your attention to 1 Timothy chapter 6. At verse 11, the Apostle Paul is reminding Timothy of his, of his covenant responsibility. He says there, but thou, O man of God, flee these things. He's talking about fleeing sin. And follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called, and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. I give thee charge in the sight of God, who quickeneth all things, and before Christ Jesus, who before Pontius Pilate witnessed a good confession, that thou keep this commandment without spot, unrebukable, until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which in his times he shall show, who is the blessed and only potentate, King of kings and Lord of lords. Paul is reminding Timothy that he made a profession of faith. But he's showing us the, the, the covenantal nature of that profession of faith. And he says, Timothy, remember, you made this profession of faith and you made it in the presence of many witnesses. That's the nature of a covenant-taking ceremony. When you have a wedding, typically, what do you do? You gather a congregation of people together, and they hear the husband and the wife, the bride and the groom, make vows before God, and they are witnesses to what you have promised, and God is witness to what you've promised. And Paul is reminding Timothy, Paul is reminding Timothy that not only did he profess that Jesus was his Lord, but he did this in the presence of many witnesses. When you confess faith, children, you make covenant with God. It's not something you can say, oh, yeah, I believe in Jesus, and tomorrow you say, oh, I, I'm not sure I really believe in Jesus anymore. You make covenant with a living God. What are some of the implications then? And, and I've already alluded to it. First of all, there, I'd like to make two applications here very quickly. One is an application to those who profess faith in Jesus and then later on go back on their profession of faith. You see, when someone does it, they'd like to think, have you to think that they were once persuaded that Jesus was Lord but now they've lost the assurance that Jesus is Lord. That's not the way covenant works. On the wedding day, a couple pledge themselves to each other to love one another, to be obedient to, to God's design for marriage. A few fights later and so forth, the, someone's saying, well, I made a mistake. No. You may have made a mistake, but you promised to God that you would live until death do you part. It's a covenant. It's a binding covenant. And it's a binding covenant when someone confesses Jesus is Lord. You don't go back on your covenant. You don't say, I've changed my mind. In Ecclesiastes chapter 5, we're warned about the importance of a covenant that we make with God. At verse 5, he says, It's better is it that you shouldest not vow than thou shouldst vow and not pay. Suffer not thy mouth to cause thy flesh to sin, neither say thou before the angel. That was an error. 
Wherefore should God be angry at thy voice and destroy the work of thy hands? If we would take seriously what God says to us, I believe you could go back and look at the times in your own life, which we all have at times when we've been unfaithful to the covenant that we've made with God. And if we would look with reflection on those circumstances in our lives, we would see that we are much like David in Psalm 32 when he talks about how there's, there's aching in his bones because he had sinned. He had committed adultery. He had committed murder. And he had kept silent and had not dealt with that sin. He'd broken covenant with God. And the irony of it is he, he finally comes to realize that. Uh, we would tend to see that he sinned against uh, Bathsheba's husband by committing adultery with her. And he sinned against her husband Uriah because he murdered him in order to get rid of him. But David would say, God, I've sinned against you and you only have I sinned. Because he broke covenant with God. The reason we can abuse one another is because God has given us a way in which we are to live so that we, in keeping covenant with God, will indeed love each other. And, and so this covenant that we enter into is important that we, we can't just walk away from it and say, oh, I professed it today. Children, oftentimes you, you might wonder, you're, you're being encouraged at times not to come and make a public profession of faith and wait till you're a little bit older. That doesn't mean that your faith in the Lord Jesus is not important today. But when you publicly state that Jesus is Lord, you're entering in covenant with him. You can't a few years later when you're being tempted with some of the, the temptations of youth to say, oh, you know, I just did that for my parents, I just did this for the church. I just did this because my friends in the church were doing it. No, you enter into covenant with God. A covenant that should not be broken. God will be angry with those who do. You stop and think of Judas. He was a follower of Jesus for three years. He was supposedly committed. He'd actually been entrusted with being the treasure for Jesus. The scriptures tell us of Judas who turned back. It would have been better for him had he never been born. It's an awesome thing to enter into covenant with God and to turn back. Listen to these words in Hebrews chapter 10 at verse 26 and following. For if we willfully, sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation, which shall devour the adversaries. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Now he begins to talk to us about the new covenant. In Christ's blood, the covenant of Christ. And he says this at verse 29. Of how much sore punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God. And hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing. And hath done despite unto the spirit of grace. Do you hear the awesomeness of what it signifies for someone who goes back on the covenant that he or she has made with the Lord? For we know him who has said, Vengeance belongeth unto me. I will re recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of of the living God. These are words about the new covenant in Christ's blood. These are words warning us of a betrayal 
of that promise that we have made, that Jesus would be our Lord. This was such a serious thing that we see recorded in the scripture for us, the things that we wouldn't necessarily be able to identify on our own today. But in Corinth, the Lord spoke in chapter 11 of how some were chronically ill in the congregation and some had died because they'd come to the covenant table, the Lord's table, having not rightly judged themselves and not rightly discerned the body of Christ. But there's another application. Uh, uh, as I encourage you, those of you who've made profession of faith, whether, whether you're adult or whether you're young people, to realize you are in covenant with God. God will keep his covenant with you. You don't have to break down. You go for him for help and he will sustain you. But, but, but this, this covenant that God makes with the children of believers is very important for us to understand. I, I would uh, remind uh, the, uh, the parents uh, who were here today presenting their son for baptism. And I would remind the many others of you who have presented your children and other occasions for baptism that it is extremely important that you nurture your children in preparation for their coming to a place where they profess faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not just a matter of oh, one day they might choose to, to follow Jesus or they might not. No, it's a matter of the fact that your child, infant, still not yet understanding who Jesus is, is under covenant with God. Under covenant with God, God has laid claim not only to you as a believer, but to your children and your children's children after you. God lays claim to these dear little children. God says, I will establish my covenant between thee, me and thee and thy seed after thee in their generations for an everlasting covenant. That's why God commands fathers that they are to train up their children, to bring them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. Dads, that's very, very important. Don't take that lightly. It's not what happens today. It's not magic. Nothing magic per se happened today apart from if the Lord were pleased by his spirit to answer our prayer and to begin even working now in this infant Nathan's life to transform him. But the Lord works by means. The Lord works by, by choosing covenant parents who will train up their children in the Lord and that the Holy Spirit would lose, use not only the ministry of the word on the Lord's day, but the ministry of the word that takes place in the home the other six days in order to nurture faith in these little children. And there may be some of you who are here in this congregation who have now reached an age of maturity where you understand God's covenant claims on your life and yet you've never really publicly professed faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. You can't just walk away and say, oh, it was my parents' faith. And you say, well, you know, I wasn't really in agreement that they had me baptized. No, you weren't. Nathaniel didn't know what was going on this morning. He didn't nod his head and say, yes, please baptize me. But you are in covenant with God. Let me illustrate this for you. I think most of us in this room probably were born in the United States of America. By the nature of your birth, a natural born, you were a natural born citizen of this nation. And as you get older, you have certain responsibilities as a citizen of this nation. There's going to come a day when you work a little bit and all of a sudden you find somebody wants taxes from you. Well, I don't want to pay taxes. No, but you're a citizen, you have to pay taxes. 
A young man, you get to a certain age, and it's not so much evident in this day, in the day in which I came along, you had to enroll, and you still have to enroll when you're 18 for the military service, only you weren't called up. Today, you're not called up. Typically, it's a volunteer army, but there's always the possibility you might be called out to go to war. You might say, but I don't want to go to war. But you're a citizen by birth. Now, it's true, when you get to age of maturity, you could say, well, I want to relinquish my citizenship as a U.S. citizen, and I want to go be a citizen of some other country in the world, and you can do that. But you know what? You can't relinquish the covenant relationship that you have with God. You're obligated as a covenant child. You're born into the family of God. You have a responsibility to respond to the claims of the gospel in your life. And the Lord calls you as surely as he did saints in the Old Testament times and saints in New Testament times. Look unto me and be saved. That brings me to the third question just very briefly. I've, I've drawn your attention to, first, uh, to, uh, to Psalm 119 verses 105 through 112. 112. What's described in this passage is the kind of relationship that we ought to have as covenant children with God. That's the kind of devotion we ought to be able to see. That we would look at, as we see in verse 105, thy word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. We take up the word of God and we say, I'm going to live by this. This is a very practical book. It designs exactly how I shall live. It's God's word. I'm in covenant with God. And this is instruction for me. This is his covenant. He tells me how to live. In verse 106, we've already dealt that. But it, do you understand that if you are in Christ Jesus, you have sworn allegiance to him. We need to live with that kind of understanding. I'm going to do what's in God's word because I am in covenant with God. Verse 107, we see in verses 107 and 108 uh, uh, the fact that it really is a covenant. Not only are we pledging certain things to God, but our pledges to God are based on his pledges to us. He established the covenant with us. And so we hear the psalmist saying in, Psalm 100, in verse 107, he says, I am afflicted very much. Quicken me, O Lord, according to your word. It's a struggle living the Christian life. There's a waging of war inside of us. The scriptures speak of the flesh waging war with the spirit and the spirit with the flesh. There's a war that goes on inside. There's also a war that goes on outside. There's a world around us that hates the Savior and more and more so in this nation. There's struggles you face. Young people, when you touch the lives of other young people, when you observe what's going on, you see there's a... a a contempt for the Lord Jesus Christ that's often expressed in our nation. You're challenged by that. You're attacked by that. You know, you don't like to have other kids laughing at you, do you? You don't like that. And when other kids come, other young people come and mock you because you are identified for Christ, at times there's temptation to not want to be mocked and and Jesus says, if you are ashamed of me in this world, I will be ashamed of you when I am before my Father in heaven. Jesus is your Savior. He's the one who is the great high priest who, who pleads continually on the behalf of his children. Beloved, we must never be ashamed of the Lord Jesus Christ. We need to ask the Lord's help, praying Telling God, I'm afflicted, but Lord, quicken me according to your word. Make me live according to your word. Make your word so precious to me that what everybody else is saying won't bother me. 
I'll stand fast. Young people, we need Daniels in this day. We need Queen Esther's ladies who are willing to stand fast, even, even if it means a threat to your life. You're committed. You, you pray, Lord, make the free will offerings of my mouth acceptable to you. Make me to flourish as a child of God. We see in, in verse 109, in verse 110, my soul is continually in my hand, yet I do not forget thy law. When you say your life is in your hand, you're recognizing how, how close you are perhaps at any moment to death. And, and the psalmist is saying, in living for you, Lord, I, I often face death. But even in the face of death, I, I will not give up. I will not surrender. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, isn't that what they said, beloved? We won't give up. If it means being burnt in the fiery furnace, so let it be. There is indeed a promise made in, in verse 111. Thy testimonies I have taken as an heritage forever. They are the rejoicing of my heart. Beloved, we need to, to ask God to nurture in us the sense that the words in this book are our greatest sense of joy. They're the delight of our souls. They're our hope for the future. And our commitment is not a commitment till death do us part. Our commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ is I will serve you forever. I have inclined my heart to perform thy statutes always, even to the end. Well, beloved, I hope I've shown you that when you say Jesus is Lord, you've made an everlasting covenant with the living God. I have hope I've shown you that Jesus is the mediator of that new covenant. And that blood shed for you, for your holiness, it speaks of God's design to make you a holy person. That you will perform what you've covenanted, that you will keep God's righteous judgments. And I hope that I've encouraged parents who are here. If you've been neglectful in, in the nurture of faith in your children, that you would renew your covenant with God to reform what you've promised, that you would do it to the very end. As long as there's life in you and as long as there's life in your children, you seek to nurture that faith. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Our Heavenly Father and our God, we come to you and we ask, O oh Lord, your blessing to be upon us. Lord, we pray that we might uh, indeed, uh, Lord, uh, Confess before you that Jesus is Lord. And you would cause us to understand that we have entered into an everlasting covenant with you. A covenant that is everlasting because you are the everlasting covenant maker. You will keep that covenant for a thousand generations. And Lord, that we will revel in heaven itself to be in a glorious relationship with our God. Hear our prayer, O oh Lord, and have mercy upon us. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's uh, sing our closing portion of, of praise to the Lord from Psalm 99. Again, beginning to sing at verse 6 and singing through the end. We'll be using tune 148. Moses and Aaron among his priests, Samuel with them all that call upon his name. These called on God, and he them answered all. Within the pillar of the cloud he unto them did speak. 
the testimonies he them taught, and laws they did not break. Thou answered them, O Lord our God, thou wast a God that gave pardon to them, though on their deeds thou wouldst this vengeance have. Do thou exalt the Lord our God, and at his holy hill do ye him worship, for the Lord our God is holy still. Let us praise him. Receive the benediction of our God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. Amen.